Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Magic, all TCGs have instances of one card being printed in multiple rarities at strongly varying price points. But why do people opt in to buying the most expensive of each card in their decks? What's up y'all, this is Big Switch from Banish for Cost here, and today we will be discussing why you should or should not max rarity your deck. I'd like to give a quick shout out to all of you for being so supportive with this new video essay format that appears to be the new trend these days for Yu-Gi-Oh! content. Another shout out to Farfa for reacting to my rogue deck video on stream. What if you don't open any Horus cards and you have normal gear suit, <laughs> then so I just I just noticed this like other tab here. <laughs> Please tell me that's deliberate. Please tell me that's on purpose. While that video was for beginners, this video is far more nuanced and geared towards a more competitive audience. So strap in and subscribe if you haven't already. This is going to be a bumpy ride. One huge aspect to collecting is nostalgia. I talked all about this in my Why Do We Collect Things video, so I'll keep that brief. But for example, I love Utopia and Code Talkers, so I picked up a CRF0, CR Utopia Rising, QCR Heat Soul, Starlight Singularity, and even Secret Alan Bershans when they were all pricey. I did this happily because I wanted to show just how much I enjoyed these decks by investing hard money into them. Was this a sound financial decision? No. Did I care? Also no. A max rarity branded engine is thousands of dollars, same as a max rarity snake eye engine. People collect these things because they truly enjoy them, be it from doing well at past events with them or just truly loving their playstyle. Konami seems to have caught on to this phenomenon as in the deck build pack, so notice most of each deck's main engine cards are available in a collector rare printing. Of course, the ultras are still available at the lower price, but people still buy these CRs. See Vanquish Soul and Live Twins as great examples of this, as even in future sets, Zhao Long got a QCR printing and all of the Live Twin monsters got Starlight printings, making the Max Rarity deck super expensive, driving the demand for these sets up even further from the collectors. For me, the most interesting thing is the difference between Max Rarity and Max Value. For example, Ultimate Book of Moon is Max Rarity. I mean, it's an ultimate. Obviously, that's crazy high rarity and it's insane. But do you want to know what's even more impressive than that? Having a super rare Book of Moon, of course. The Champion Pack Super Book of Moon is currently $950. You could only get these back in the day for competing in official tournaments, so the scarcity of near mint copies makes the value go through the roof. One thing you'll notice with this game is that even though these playsets go for such exorbitant prices, there will always be a pro player on a feature match playing with them. Many people feel like they would prefer to buy a car instead of a Yu-Gi-Oh deck, which is certainly understandable, so why do pro players do this? While surveying the Yu-Gi-Oh landscape, it's hard to miss the pro players who bling their decks out to the max. These cases are examples of players who care more about their deck's rarity and are likely to have spent more time with the deck. An important takeaway here, however, is that correlation does not equal causation regarding players like Pac, for example, who use high rarity cards and perform well. Just because you own these super expensive cards, doesn't mean you have the game sense to play them to a high tier level. Everyone knows a quarter century Ash Blossom is not once per turn, negates and destroys, and cannot be responded to, while the common Ash Blossom requires the user to win a game of rock, paper, scissors in order to successfully negate. Also, many duelists have the shiny cardboard autism instead of the good with women or cure cancer autism. The prices of these cards make far more sense once you factor in these two major details. Casual collectors and the biggest flexors aside, why is it that competitive players actually max rarity their decks? Surely these pro players don't use any of these reasonings into their deck building strategy as they aren't real and I'm clearly memeing. The QCR Ash Blossom does the exact same thing as the common, so why would anyone ever spend that much extra money on them? It just does not make sense. Or does it? 
Patrick Hoban says the following is true. A. Higher rarity cards make you more engaged in your games. B. When you are more engaged in your games, you play better. C. When you play better, you perform better. Therefore, higher rarity cards lead to better performance. This is a classic example of hypothetical syllogism, a valid argument form rarely used but extremely helpful in a debate setting when explaining your argument logically. It's a basic if A is B and B is C, then A is C structure. This argument is a large portion of why competitive players opt in to max rarity. While all cards are just physical representations of a concept of an in-game action, it's hard to say that you would be the most engaged using the higher rarity version of the card than you would with all other versions. The higher level of engagement would subsequently lead to you making better in-game decisions, which would increase your overall performance. Citing the Pygmalion effect, Patrick uses this to justify maximum rarity. The Pygmalion effect is just what was described, a psychological phenomenon in which high expectations lead to improved performance in a given area and low expectations lead to worse. The more expensive your cards are, the higher the expectations. The cheaper your cards are, the lower the expectations. You may think you're above this superficial, materialistic mindset, but I promise you are not. Due to the Pygmalion effect, if you were to view yourself in two separate dimensions in a tournament, one where your deck is max rarity, one where your deck is min rarity, statistically the dimension in which you have the max rarity deck will be the dimension in which you do better in the tournament. This is the real reason pro players max out their decks, but what about players who are competitive collectors and not quite pros? What's on the other side of the max rarity coin? New Slaves is one of Kanye West's many magnum opuses. It delves into consumerism and materialism in the modern world. It discusses lower income people spending $10,000 a year on designer products instead of investing it in a Roth IRA or a mutual fund. These designer products degrade in value very quickly, opposed to investments, which statistically will always increase. This ensures low-income people stay in poverty, ensuring that corporations have buyers starving for their next product launch. Media plays just as heavy a role in this. The vast majority of rappers don expensive pieces, celebrities always being asked, who are they wearing? Is it Balenci or Prada? Jewelry is to rappers as max rarity is to competitive players. We may not realize it, but this keeping up with the Joneses mentality carries over to our favorite card game of choice as well. If you see Pac play a $2,700 QCR Snake Eye engine with a $700 SP Little Knight, you are amazed. You hype him up in the comments, you ogle over the core, then think to yourself, man, I would love to own that. You see the backpack vendor at a regional with the binder dedicated to ghost rares, and the status alone is near irresistible to you. Well, maybe it's not. Does this not apply to you? Well, consider yourself lucky. Keeping up with the Joneses is born and bred through our lower to middle class caste systems in America. Our parents didn't grow up with the skills needed to grow wealth. They simply wanted to ensure everyone else thought that they were wealthy. So who are we to really know any better? If it's not the $2,000 car note they were paying off or the $2,000 monthly rent on their house that they'll never own, it was something else designed to keep them in the hole for appearances alone. To think this doesn't plague the Yu-Gi-Oh card game is just simply inaccurate. Only when we stop taking payday loans to buy decks that are getting reprinted at the end of the year will we begin to put an end to this cycle. To those that need to hear it, the health and stability of your future family and kids will always be more important than what kind of printing style is used on the cardboard you played with for a year or two. Just because pro players use these expensive cards doesn't mean they're being irresponsible. Many of them are sponsored, so the cards are essentially free, while others legitimately make enough money to the point where picking up a $4,000 engine is more than manageable and doesn't interfere with their finances. So what's the takeaway here? Always use min rarity because only bozos with no financial literacy play with expensive cards? Absolutely not. Play the cards you're comfortable with playing. If you're hesitating on picking up a high rarity variation of a card, that is a bad sign financially. 
though if you do buy it, the Pygmalion effect indicates you will perform better with it. Ultimately, no amount of financial gurus or advice you hear will change your life for the better. All that will do this is your own actions. Use advice to better yourself, strive for happiness and family above all else, and don't stress it. Life is amazing, and it sure helps to have money to enjoy it, but accolades and accomplishments are just as important. Do whatever you see fit to live your best life. Comment your thoughts down below, don't forget to like the video if you learned something, and if you were ever curious as to why we collect things at all, check out this video right here.